Beth, welcome. Okay, can you do a brief introduction uh, about yourself and then uh, your presentation, please? My name is um, Beth Beam. I am the project coordinator at UNMC for something called Heroes. Um, and it's actually kind of nice that Morgan was just on. Um, in the past, um, I served as the educator for the Bi Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. It was back when we didn't have nearly as much funding and, and those sorts of things. And so um, Morgan is, a, is an example of one of the other people who um, has taken on a lot of those roles as I've moved on and done more uh, research-related activities. And so um, so I, I know a lot of that and, and have been able to take that on to other things. But over all of that time, I was the project director for something called Heroes, and that's what I'm going to explain to you today. We are a um, traveling education show, I would say, for emergency preparedness in general. And a big chunk of that is biological related, infectious disease related in terms of um, what we've done um, in terms of emergency preparedness in general. Um, but it, like I said, I, I look forward to telling you a little bit more about how we have been able to do that across our state, across a very rural state, um, but the impact that that's had both nationally and globally as well. So let me pop this into display mode. And I'll put it on your screen. Are you guys seeing that okay? Okay. Yes. Excellent. So, like I said, um, for roughly 19 years, I've been a part of this emergency preparedness grant where we really try to teach all things preparedness. So, this grant was born in roughly 2005. And for us in the United States, that was roughly four years after, four to five years after our experiences with the World Trade Center attacks and our, our anthrax in the mail experience. So we were very um, sensitive to the concepts of bioterrorism, as well as we had just experienced a very um, intense hurricane season with Hurricane Katrina in areas of the country where um, the response to that was difficult. And so there was a real want and recognition from a public health standpoint that domestically we have a lot of disconnections there. The uh, Department of Homeland Security was still very early in its um, time. And so um, one of the grants that Dr. Smith worked with our College of Nursing and College of Allied Health Professions to make was this hands-on, this focus on hands-on training for health profession students and healthcare providers across our state. And so um, I had, I was lucky enough to be selected to be the pro program coordinator for this grant for a great many years. Um, and now, like I said, I am the director of it. Um, so we, we really try to be um, interdisciplinary and interprofessional, I would say, in terms of really helping people to learn um, not only what all the different professional roles are, but how they can work as teams together. Um, and it's really focused on teaching all the different potential kind of threats that exist. Um, and certainly, um, Morgan uh, briefly mentioned things like chemical response in hospitals and things like that. The, the level of ski gear she spoke about really is focused on um, how we might respond, for example, to a farmer who's been exposed to pesticides. We don't necessarily want to just walk them into the hospital. We want to teach people to wash them off first and how to do that safely. So um, that's just a good example of the kind of content that we teach. We are, like I said, spearheaded by our College of Nursing, our College of Allied Health Professions, and then um, the Center for Preparedness Education here at UNMC. And that's a an entity that's a bit separate in our College of Public Health that really has been focused over the years on, on teaching this content. And they, they get a bit more of our state dollars to make sure that the preparedness happens at the state level. Our funding actually comes from some university grants. Um, and what's nice about that is that not only does it 
it becomes a, a um, dollars that we get every year and they actually do go up with um, the normal um, increases that we see over time for things like inflation. So over the years, it has been a multi-million dollar grant for our college. So <clears throat> within the first year or two of the grant, we were actually able not only to buy a lot of hands-on training equipment, but also the truck and trailer that you see in the picture. And so that allows us to take um, all of these wonderful educational tools and take them on the road to interact with hospitals and, and educational institutions across our state. Um, and so that's just a wonderful um, mechanism. The, the trailer can be used truly to haul things, but it can also um, turn into an incident command center. Um, we have hookups inside of it that are very similar to an ambulance. And so you can put your gurney in and lock it down and start working on your patient. We have some countertops that can be pulled up. We have um, cabinets inside that you can put your equipment in to really make it feel um, like it's a care center if we need it to be for a triage simulation or something like that. And so you'll get to see pictures here in a second. But like I said, the, the key here is that um, while sometimes you do need to set the stage with some kind of lecture or something like that, um, that, that we really want to focus on that hands-on training. We'll brief people, we'll get them into that hands-on training that forces them to think of, um, about being a team, and then they will have the opportunity to reflect on that learning experience. The thing I would tell you um, about that is that one of the key things we're able to do is take those educational um, pieces of equipment and actually put them inside people's emergency room um, or put them in the, the negative pressure isolation room that they're going to use for infection control and have them really walk through the challenges they're going to find in their environment. I always think of um, when we do a CPR code um, if you can't find where something is in your cart or where the where the probe is for a particular piece of equipment, um, the, the learning that goes on is learning how to logistically get all of the parts and, and pieces in your facility is a piece of that learning as well. Beyond just maybe going to a simulation laboratory and learning, you're learning where the things are in your physical environment. And I think that absolutely does have... Um, some some wonderful um, results. Um, we often refer to that as in situ simulation or I M S I T U in situ simulation. So um, along with that, we have been able to purchase um, human patient simulators. Um, that was one of the interesting things that I think as far as the evolution of simulation in the early two thousands was that they had figured out how to make these. Um, these mannequins for education all of a sudden talk to you, make funny erping noises. Um, uh, the the one we originally bought would would go into trismus or he would clench his teeth. That always kind of uh, freaked people out. If I could um, if I could make him uh, make horrible uh, tummy ache noises, that always scared the clinicians. Um, so any of those kind of realistic pieces that that put them in the moment um, of the simulation or what sometimes we call fidelity um, was really um, a beneficial thing. And I can say in real situations where I've had to do um, had to do CPR and things like that, it is funny how the, the person before you becomes that dummy and you just get down on your knees and you get to work. And I think the value of that um, peace and remembering all the things that you learned, you really do go back to that hands-on training that you had to make sure that, you know, if the if the person is in the arms of the person who cares for them, you really have to convince them that you need to be able to lay them flat and get their airway open. And so sometimes just having those physical experiences with a mannequin like this makes such a difference in your ability to operate um, when emotions are much different. So this is a an image that's a little bit hard to see, but there's a there's a dotted line across here that is the borders of our state. They go across here, and then there's a little panhandle here. 
but our our state is roughly 500 miles wide the the population is greater on the east side of the state than the western side but that um, doesn't mean that people don't live out there where our our main um sort of artery across the state is our interstate um, and so we've really been able to access those communities with the truck and trailer. Um, we actually have nursing programs in five of these cities. And so that also gives us sort of a geographic reach. They are in Scotts Bluff, in Norfolk right here, Lincoln, Kearney, which is kind of in the middle, and then Omaha is on this eastern side by the river. And so we have five different campuses that we that we serve with our College of Nursing. Allied Health is in Omaha and Kearney, and we're soon to have um, our medicine program as well in the in the Kearney area. And so the more outreach that we continue to do, the more school that is available to health profession students in rural areas, um, the more likely they are to stay and, and do that work um, with their own community. And so the more that we can bring emergency preparedness to them as well, um, simply makes it safer for everyone in our state. So <clears throat> just some examples of the kinds of things that we do. I mentioned the um, farmer maybe who's been sprayed with pesticides. Um, we come up with all kinds of situations. Perhaps there's a fire and a nursing home needs to evacuate. Um, how do you go about deciding who goes first, who goes on what vehicles, um, what facilities do they need to be transferred to? We, we create simulations for those kinds of uh, cognitive con uh, conversations about planning and executing those kinds of things. And then again, obviously, the hands-on parts of actually physically moving people and figuring out how to manage that. We have, um, along with that physical training, I've had the joy of, for those 20 years of exploiting people to develop media. So we've got uh, media on emergency response, personal protective equipment basics, and um, again, like I said, how to deal with those contamination events. And then obviously as the educator for the biocontainment unit, we have a lot of content on the website for that as well. Um, so a lot of infection control pieces, donning and doffing personal protective equipment, a lot of the things that Morgan mentioned honestly about respirator use, um, really nailing down key elements of how to use respirators properly. So really handy educational materials if you find yourself needing to train staff on doing things appropriately. And then, so just a few images of the kinds of things we're talking about. The upper left image is chocolate syrup, um, I promise. Um, but we were trying to simulate that chemical exposure with one of our students. You can see directly below him, that is the setup that we would use um, that, that many of our hospitals have for decontamination. It's a portable shower. And you can see them in that um, chemical gear that um, Morgan spoke about just a little while ago. You can see our students in the upper middle um, doing some CPR on, on small babies and, and children. And then um, more of the infection control piece here in the middle and, and toward the bottom, getting on your high level PPE or your full gear and, and working with an isopod. Um, we do do a lot with evacuation as well. The, the device that you see in the, um, on the right in the bottom there um, is a, a, what's called a med sled. And you can see them dragging the person across the floor. You can imagine if the power is out and those sorts of things and we need to get people moved. That's one way to do it. That particular device also has the ability to um, sort of anchor it with a strap and, and lower it down a stairwell. And so, again, not something you want to do without a little bit of training. And so great opportunities for us to teach the students about things that they will see in the hospital um, as they interact. One of the other things that we really enjoy teaching the students is triage, um, mainly because it really doesn't exist in our nursing curriculum, um, but we often find that it's helpful in, in a number of different professions. So you can see we, we typically train a little bit about um, what's called in the United States, Stop the Bleed, which is a certification program for using tourniquets. Um, unfortunately, that's also in these 15 years become a much more important piece 
with all of our active shooter situations in the United States. And so um, getting those kits around our campus, making sure the students know how to use them um, and that they're trained is really an important piece for us. But we do that with a lot of fun too, in terms of, you can see our student hiding under the desk there with her moulage on with her broken arm. Um, <clears throat> Brittany is on the in the bottom two pictures working on some movie makeup to make sure our victims look, um, uh, have the fidelity that, that will generate some emotional response. And then you can see our students in the upper right hand corner there with their hard hats on and their and their vests being the triager and actually having to have that conversation with somebody that I'm here to help. I'm going to give you a triage tag and help is on the way um, that they're they're learning how to assess a scene um, so that they can convey good information to the responders that are on the way. And so um, learning the colors of triage, learning what those things mean. Um, and it may be that they never conduct that in their professional life in a hospital, but if they understand the colors, um, they understand what's coming into their emergency room or what has happened to a patient who now is in their medical surgical unit. And so again, um, getting the getting more of an understanding of the public health concepts and the emergency uh, medicine concepts that impact the patient care at the bedside for our nurses. So it just, like I said, reiterating the Stop the Bleed program, which is a, a nationally certified program um, that we train with those folks that desire it. Like I said, we talked about the med sled, which you see again there, and also um, the different evacuation chairs that also make it easier to come downstairs in buildings where um, elevators may not be functional at the time of an evacuation. All of our materials are available on our HEROES website. Um, we've had 2.2 uh, million lifetime views. I think that's the one thing that has surprised me the most. While we generated this education for Nebraska, the, the human element of it and the engagement across the world has been amazing. And we do see people checking in, um, you know, as, as, as we've watched over the years, um, situations where people need our content. Um, it sort of warms your heart when you see that they are reaching out and asking to download our content. And so um, it makes you feel like, you know, that people are finding us and finding the resources and they appreciate it. And that's that's a wonderful thing. So please know that you are certainly welcome if you need these kinds of materials. If you have suggestions for us, for materials that we should be making, there are mechanisms in the website to contact us. And we would love to have ideas um, the, the, that's what fuels the HEROES program is the needs that people tell us about. And so please do not be afraid. Um, I wish to um, exploit Stephen Smith's talents at least another 15 years. So, and just an example of our COVID page, you're welcome to that as well. Um, and, and the different ways that we have the modules by profession and, and different ways you can interact on the website to find all of that content. Oops, that's the wonderful team that makes up the Heroes Project. Um, and we're absolutely, like I said, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to speak with you guys. Stop sharing. Okay, thanks about that. Yes, thank you. Take care.